Welcome back, witches and wizards, for another reading of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Today we're going to be reading Chapter 9, The Midnight Duel. Harry had never believed he would meet a boy that he hated more than Dudley, but that was before he had ever met Draco Malfoy. Still, first-year Gryffindors only had potions with Slytherins, so they didn't have to put up with Malfoy much. Or, at least, they didn't until they spotted a notice pinned up in the Gryffindor common room that made them all groan. Flying lessons would be starting on Thursday and Gryffindor and Slytherin would be learning together. Typically, typical, said Harry darkly, just what I always wanted to make a fool of myself on a broomstick with Malfoy watching. He had been looking forward to learning to fly more than anything else. You don't know that you'll make a fool of yourself, said Ron reasonably. Anyways, I know Malfoy's always going on about how good he has a, how good he is at Quidditch, but I bet it's all talk. Malfoy currently did talk about flying a lot. He complained loudly about first years never getting on the house Quidditch teams and told long, boastful stories that always seemed to end with him narrowly escaping muggles and helicopters. He wasn't the only one, though. The way Seamus Finnegan told it, he'd spent most of his childhood zooming around the countryside on his broomstick. Even Ron would tell anyone who'd listen about the time he'd almost hit a hand glider on Charlie's old broom. Everyone from Wizarding Families talked about Quidditch constantly. Ron had already had a big argument with Dean Thomas, who shared their dormitory, about soccer. Ron couldn't see what was so exciting about a game with only one ball where nobody was allowed to fly. Harry had caught Ron prodding Dean's, prodding Dean's poster of West Ham's soccer team, trying to make the players move. Neville had never been on a broomstick in his life because his grandmother had never let him near one. Privately, Harry felt she'd had good reason, because Neville managed to have an extraordinary number of accidents, even with both feet firmly planted on the ground. Hermione Granger was almost as nervous about flying as Neville was. This was something you couldn't learn by heart out of a book, not that she hadn't tried. At breakfast on Thursday, she bored them all with stupid flying tips she'd gotten out of the library called Quidditch Through the Ages. Neville was hanging on to her every word, desperate for anything that might help him hang on to his broomstick later. But everybody else was very pleased when Hermione's lecture was interrupted by the arrival of mail. Harry hadn't had a single letter since Hackard's note, something that Malfoy had been quick to notice, of course. Malfoy's eagle owl was always bringing him packages of sweets from home, which he openly gloated at the Slytherin table. A barn owl brought Neville a small package from his grandmother. He opened it excitedly and showed them a glass ball the size of a large marble, which seemed to be full of white smoke. That's a rememberal, he explained. Grand knows I forget things. This tells you if there's something you've forgotten to do. Look, you hold it tight like this, and if it turns red, oh. His face fell, because the rememberal had suddenly glowed scarlet. You've forgotten something. Neville was trying to remember what he had forgotten when Draco Malfoy, who was passing the Gryffindor table, snatched the rememberal out of his hand. Harry and Ron jumped to their feet. They were half hoping for a reason to fight, but Professor McGonagall, who would, could spot trouble quicker than any teacher in the school, was there in a flash. What's going on? Malfoy's got my rememberal, Professor. Scowling, Malfoy quickly dropped the rememberal back on the table. Just looking, he said, and he sloped away with Crab and Goyle behind him. At 3.30 that afternoon, Harry and Ron and the other Gryffindors hurried down the front steps onto the garden grounds for their first flying lesson. It was a clear, breezy day, and the grass rippled under their feet as they marched down the sloping lawns toward a smooth, flat lawn on the opposite side of the grounds to the forbidden forest, whose trees were swaying darkly in the distance. The Slytherins were already there, and so were twenty broomsticks laying in neat lines on the ground. Harry had heard Fred and George Weasley complain about the old school brooms, saying that none of them started to vib saying that some of them started to vibrate if you flew too high 
or always flew slightly to the left. Their teacher, Madame Hooch, arrived. She had short gray hair and yellow eyes like a hawk. Well, what are you all waiting for? She barked. Everyone stand by a broomstick. Come on, hurry up. Harry glanced down at his broom. It was old and some of the twigs stuck out at odd angles. Stick out your right hand over your broom, called Madame Hooch at, at the front, and say, up. Up, everyone shouted. Harry's broom jumped into his hand at once, but it was one of the few that did. Hermione Granger's had simply rolled over onto the ground. Neville's hadn't moved at all. Perhaps brooms, like horses, could tell when you were afraid, thought Harry. There was a quiver in Neville's voice that said only too clearly that he wanted to keep his feet firmly on the ground. Madame Hooch then showed them how to mount with their brooms without sliding off the end, walked up and down the rows, correcting their grip. Harry and Ron were delighted when she told Malfoy he had been doing it wrong for years. Now, when I blow my whistle, you kick off from the ground. Hard, said Madame Hooch. Keep your broom steady, raise a few feet, and then come straight back down by leaning forward slightly. On my whistle, three, two, but Neville, nervous and jumpy, and frightened of being left on the ground, pushed off hard before the whistle had touched Madame Hooch's lips. Come back! boy, she shouted, but Neville was raising straight up like a cork shot out of a bottle. Twelve feet, twenty feet. Harry saw his scared white face look down at the ground, falling away from him, saw him gasp, slide up sideways off his broom, and wham! A thud and a nasty crack, and Neville lay face down on the grass in a heap. His broomstick was still rising higher and higher and started to drift lazily toward the forbidden forest and out of sight. Madame Hooch was bending over Neville, her face as white as his. Broken wrist, Harry heard her mutter. Come on, boy, it's all right. Up you get. She turned to the rest of the class. None of you is to move while I take this boy to the hospital wing. You leave those brooms where they are and, or you'll be out of Hogwarts before you can even say quidditch. Come on, dear. Neville, his face tear streaked, clutched his wrist and hobbled off with Madame Hooch, who had her arm around him. No sooner were they out of earshot than Malfoy burst into laughter. Did you see his face? The great lump. The other Slytherins joined in. Shut up, Malfoy, snapped Pavardi Pavil. Ooh, sticking up long bottom, said Pansy Parkinson, a flat a hard faced Slytherin girl. Never thought you'd like a fat little cry baby, Pavati. Look said Malfoy, darting forward and snatching something out of the grass. It's that stupid thing Longbottom's grand sent him. The rememberal glittered in the sun as he held it up. Give that he, Malfoy, said Harry quietly. Everyone stopped, talking to watch. Malfoy smiled nastily. I think I'll leave it somewhere for Longbottom to find. How about up a tree? Give it here, Harry yelled. But Malfoy had leapt onto his broomstick and taken off. He hadn't been lying. He could fly well. Hovering level with the topmost branches of an oak, he called, Come and get it, Potter. Harry grabbed his broom. No, shouted Hermione Granger. Madam Hooch told us not to move. You'll get us all into trouble. Harry ignored her. Blood was pounding in his ears. He mounted the broom and kicked hard against the ground and up, up into the air he soared. Air rushing through his hair and his robes whipped out behind him and a joy of fierce, and in a rush of jo fierce joy, he realized he had found something he could do without being taught. This was easy. This was wonderful. He pulled his broomstick up a little to take it even higher and heard screams and gasps of girls back on the ground and an admiring whoop from Ron. He turned his broomstick sharply to face Malfoy in midair. Malfoy looked stunned. Get it here, Harry called, or I'll knock you off your broom. Oh, yeah, said Malfoy, trying to sneer, but looking worried. Harry knew somehow what to do. He leaned forward and grasped the broom tightly in both hands, and it shot toward Malfoy like a javelin. Malfoy only just got out of the way in time. Harry made a sharp about face and held the broom steady. A few people below were clapping. 
No crab and goyle up here to save your neck, Malfoy, Harry called. The same thought seemed to have struck Malfoy. Catch it if you can, then, he shouted, and he threw the glass ball high into the air, streaking back towards the ground. Harry saw, as though in slow motion, the ball rise up in the air and then start to fall. He leaned forward and pointed his broom handle down. Next second, he was gathering speed in a steep dive, racing the ball, wind whistling in his ears, mingled with the screams of people watching. He stretched out his hand, a foot from the ground, he caught it, just in time to pull his broom straight. He toppled gently onto the ground with a rememberal, rememberal clutched safely in his fist. Harry Potter! His heart sank faster than he could dive. Professor McGonagall was running toward them. He got to his feet, trembling. Never in all my time at Hogwarts. Professor McGonagall was almost speechless with shock, and her glasses, glasses flashed furiously. How dare you! Might have broken your neck. It wasn't his fault, Professor. Be quiet, Miss Patil. But Malfoy, that's enough, Mr. Weasley. Potter, follow me, now. Harry caught sight of Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle's triumphant faces as he left, walking numbly to in Professor McGonagall's wake as she strode towards the castle. He was going to be expelled. He just knew it. He wanted to say something to defend himself, but there seemed to be something wrong with his voice. Professor McGonagall was sweeping along without even looking at him. He had to jog to keep up. Now he'd done it. He hadn't even lasted two weeks. He'd be packing his bags in ten minutes. What would the Dursley say when he turned up on their doorstep? Up the front steps, up the marble staircase inside, and still Professor McGonagall didn't say a word to him. She retched open doors, marching along corridors with Harry trotting miserably behind her. Maybe she was taking him to Dumbledore, he thought. He thought of Hagrid, expelled, but allowed to stay on as a grounds gameskeeper. Perhaps he could be Hagrid's assistant. His stomach twisted as he imagined it, watching Ron and the others become wizards while he stumped around the grounds carrying Hagrid's bag. Professor McGonagall stopped outside a classroom. She opened the door, poked her head inside. <clears throat> Excuse me, Professor Fitwick. Could I, could I borrow wood for a moment? Wood, thought Harry, bewildered, as wood, a cane, she was going to use on him. But wood turned out to be a person, a burly fifth-year boy who came out of Fitwick's class looking confused. Follow me, you two said Professor McGonagall, and they marched up the corridor, Wood looking curiously at Harry. In he, Professor McGonagall pointed them into a classroom that had been ex empty except for Peeves, who was busy writing rude words on the blackboard. Out, Peeves, she barked. Peeves threw the chalk into the bin, which clanged loudly, and he whooped out, cursing. Professor McGonagall slammed the door behind him and turned to face the two boys. Potta, this is Oliver Wood. Wood, I have found you a seeker. Wood's expression changed from puzzlement to delight. Are you serious, Professor? Absolutely, said Professor McGonagall crisply. The boy's a natural. I haven't seen anything like it. Was that your first time on a broomstick, Potter? Harry nodded silently. He didn't have a clue what was going on, but he didn't seem to be expelled, and some of the feelings started to come back to his legs. He cocked that thing in his hands about 55 feet dive, Professor McGonagall told Wood. Didn't even scratch himself. Charlie Weasley couldn't have done it. Wood was now looking as though all of his dreams had come true at once. Ever seen a game of Quidditch, Potter? He asked excitedly. Woods is the captain of the Gryffindor team, Professor McGonagall explained. He just, he's just the build for a seeker too, said Woods now walking around Harry and staring at him. Light, speedy. We'll have to get him a decent broom, Professor. A Nimbus 2000 or Queen Clean Sweep 7, I'd say. I shall speak to Professor Dumbledore and see if we can't bend the first year rule. Heaven knows we need a better team than last year. 
flattened in the last match by Slytherin. I couldn't look at Severus Snape in the face for weeks. Professor McGonagall peered sternly over her glasses at Harry. I want to hear your training hard, Potter, or I may change my mind about punishing you. Then she suddenly smiled. Your father would have been proud. He was an excellent Quidditch player himself. You're joking. It was dinner time. Harry had just finished telling Ron what had happened when he had left the grounds with Professor McGonagall. Ron had a piece of steak and kidney pie halfway to his mouth, but he'd forgotten all, the way, all about it. Seeker, he said, but first years never. You must be the youngest play, house player in about a century, said Harry, shoveling pie into his mouth. He felt particularly hungry about after the excitement of the afternoon. Wood told me. Ron was so amazed, so impressed. He just sat and gaped at Harry. I stop training next week, said Harry. Only don't tell anyone. Wood wants to keep it a secret. Fred and George Weasley now came into the hall and spotted Harry and hurried over. Well done, said George in a low voice. Wood told us. Won the team too. Beat us. I tell you, we're going to win that Quidditch Cup for sure this year, said Fred. We haven't won since Charlie left, but this year's team's going to be brilliant. You must be good, Harry. Wood was almost skipping when he told us. Anyways, we've got to go. Lee Jordan reckons he's found a new secret passage out of the school. Bet it's that one behind the statue of Gregory the Swami that, he found, that we found in our first week. See ya! Fred and George had hardly disappeared when someone far less welcoming turned up, Malfoy, flanked by Crab and Goyle. Having the last meal, Potter. When are you getting the train back to the Muggles? You're a lot braver now that you're back on the ground and you've got your little friends with you, said Harry coolly. There was, of course, nothing at all little about Crab and Goyle, but as the high table was full of teachers, neither of them could do more than crack their knuckles and scold. I take you on any time on my own, said Malfoy. Tonight, if you want. Wizards duel. Wands only, no contact. What's the matter? Never heard of a wizard's duel before, I suppose. Of course he has, said Ron, wheeling around. I'm his second. Who's yours? Malfoy looked at Crab and Goyle, sizing them up. Crab, he said. Midnight, all right? We'll meet you in the trophy room. It's always unlocked. When Malfoy had gone, Harry and Ron looked at each other. What is a wizard's duel? said Harry, and what do you mean you're my second? Well, a second's there to take over if you die, said Ron casually, getting started at last on his cold pie. Catching the look on Harry's face, he added quickly, but people only die in proper duels, you know, with real wizards. The most you and Malfoy would be able to do is send sparks at each other. Neither of you knows enough magic to do any real damage. I bet he expected you to refuse anyways. And what if I wave my wand and nothing happens? Throw it away. Punch him in the nose, Ron suggested. Excuse me. They both looked up. It was Hermione Granger. Can't a person eat in peace in this place, said Ron. Hermione ignored him and spoke to Harry. I couldn't help overhear what you and Malfoy were saying. Bet you could, Ron muttered. And you mustn't go wandering around the school at night. Think of the points you'll lose, Gryffindor, if you're caught. And you're bound to be. It's very selfish of you. And it's really none of your business, said Harry. Goodbye, said Ron. At the same time, all at the same time, it wasn't that you'd call the prefect. All, all the same, it wasn't what you'd call the perfect end to the day. As Harry lay awake much later listening to Dean and Seamus fall asleep, Neville wasn't back from the hospital wing. Ron had spent all evening giving him advice such as, if he tries to curse you, you'd better dodge it because I can't remember how to block them. There was a very good chance they were going to get caught by Filch and Mrs. Norris, and Harry felt he was pushing his luck, breaking another school rule today. On the other hand, Malfoy's sneer faced, faced 
kept looming up out of the darkness. This was his big chance to beat Malfoy face to face, and he couldn't miss it. Half past eleven, Ron muttered at last. Better go. They pulled on their bathrobes, picked up their wands, and crept across the tower room, down the spiral staircase, and into the Gryffindor common room. A few embers were still glowing in the fireplace, turning all the armchairs into hunchback shadows. They had almost reached the portrait hole when a voice spoke from the chair nearest them. I can't believe you're going to do this, Harry. A lamp flickered on. It was Hermione Granger, wearing a pink bathrobe and a frown. You, Ron said furiously, go back to bed. I almost told your brother, Hermione snapped. Percy, he's a prefect. He'd put a stop to this. Harry couldn't believe anyone could be so interfering. Come on, he said to Ron. He pushed open the portrait of the fat lady and climbed through the hole. Hermione wasn't going to give up that easily. She followed Ron through the portrait hole, hissing at them like an angry goose. Don't you care about Gryffindor? Do you only care about yourselves? I don't want Slytherin to win the House Cup, and you'll lose all the points I got from Professor, from Professor McGonagall for knowing about switching spells. Go away. All right, but I warn you, you just remember what I said. When you're on the train home tomorrow, you're so... But what they were, they didn't find out. Hermione had turned to the portrait of the fat lady to go back inside and found herself facing an empty painting. The fat lady had gone on a nighttime visit and Hermione was locked out of the Gryffindor Tower. Now what am I going to do? She asked shrilly. That's your problem, said Ron. We've got to go. We're going to be late. They hadn't even reached the end of the corridor when Hermione had caught up with them. I'm coming with you, she said. You are not. Do you think I'm going to stand here and wait for Filch to catch me? If he finds all three of us, I'll tell him the truth that I was trying to stop you and you can back me up. <laughs> You've got some nerve, said Ron loudly. Shut up, both of you, said Harry sharply. I heard something. It was sort of a snuffle. Miss Norris? breathed Ron, squinting through the dock. It wasn't Miss Norris. It was Neville. He was curled up on the floor, fast asleep, but jerked suddenly awake as they crept near. Thank goodness you found me. I've been out here for hours. I couldn't remember the new password to get into bed. Keep your voice down, Neville. The password's pig snout. But it won't help now. The fat lady's gone off somewhere. How's your arm? said Harry. Fine, Neville said, showing them. Madam Pumphrey mended it in about a minute. Good. Well, look, Neville, we've got somewhere to be. We'll see you later. Don't leave me, said Neville, scrambling to his feet. I don't want to stay here alone. The bloody baron's been passed twice already. Ron looked at his watch and then glared furiously at Hermione and Neville. If either of you get us caught, I'll never rest until I've learned that curse of the bogeys Quirrell told us about and use it on you. Hermione opened her mouth, perhaps to tell Ron exactly how to use the curse of the bogeys, but Harry hissed at her to be quiet and beckoned them all forward. They flitted along the corridor, striped with bars of moonlight from the high windows. At every turn, Harry expected to run into Filch or Mrs. Norris, but they were lucky. They sped up a staircase to the third floor and tiptoed toward the trophy room. Malfoy and Crabbe weren't there yet. The crystal trophy case glimmered where the moonlight caught them. Cups, shields, plates, and statues winked silver and gold in the darkness. They edged along the walls, keeping their eyes on the doors at either end of the room. Harry took out his wand in case Malfoy leapt in and started at once. The minutes crept by. He's late. Maybe he chickened out, Ron whispered. Then a noise in the next room made them jump. Harry had only just raised his wand when they heard someone speak, and it wasn't Malfoy. Sniff around, my sweet. They must be lurking in a corner. It was Filch speaking to Mrs. Norris. Horror struck. 
Harry waved madly at the other three to follow him as quickly as possible. They scurried silently towards the door, away from Filch's voice. Neville's robes had barely whipped around the corner when they heard Filch enter the trophy room. The in here somewhere, they heard him mutter, probably hiding. This way, Harry mouthed to the others, and petrified, they began to creep down a long gallery full of suits of armor. They could hear Filch getting nearer. Neville suddenly let out a frightened squeak and broke into a run. run. He tripped, grabbed Ron's arm around, grab, grabbed Ron around the waist, and the pair of them toppled right into a suit of armor. The clinging and crashing were enough to wake the whole castle. Run! Harry yelled, and the four of them sprinted down the gallery, not looking back to see whether Filch was following. They swung around the doorpost and galloped down one corridor, then another. Harry in the lead without any idea where they were going, where they were or where they were going. They ripped through a tapestry and found themselves in a hidden passageway, hurtling along it and came out near the charms classroom, which they knew was miles from the trophy room. I think we've lost him, Harry panted, leaning against the cold wall and wiping his forehead. Neville was bent, doubled, wheezing and sputtering. I told you... Hermione gasped, clutching at the stitch in her chest. I told you. We've got to get back to Gryffindor Tower, said Ron, quickly as possible. Malfoy tricked you, Hermione said to Harry. You realize that, don't you? He was never going to meet you. Filch knew someone was going to be in the trophy room. Malfoy must have tipped him off. Harry thought he was, she was probably right, but he wasn't going to tell her that. Let's go. It wasn't going to be that simple. They hadn't gone more than a dozen paces when a doorknob rattled and something came shooting out of the classroom in front of them. It was Peeves. He caught sight of them and gave a squeal of delight. Shut up, Peeves. Please, you'll get us thrown out. Peeves cackled. Wandering around at midnight, Ickle Fursties. Ta ta ta, bloody naughty, you'll get caught. Not if you don't give us away, Peeves. Please. Should I tell Phil? Should I? I should, said Peeves in a saintly voice, but his eyes glittered wickedly. It's for your own good, you know. Get out of the way, snapped Ron, taking a swipe at Peeves. But this was a mistake. Students out of bed, Peeves bellowed. Students out of bed, down the charms corridor. Ducking under Peeves, they ran for their lives right to the end of the corridor where they slammed into a door and it was locked. That's it, Ron moaned as they pushed helplessly at the door. We're done for. This is the end. They could hear footsteps, Filch running as fast as he could towards Peeves' shouts. Oh, move over, Hermione snarled. snarled. She grabbed Harry's wand, tapped the lock, and whispered, Alohomora. The lock clicked and the door swung open. They piled through it, shut it quickly, and pressed their ears against it, listening. Which way did they go, Peeves? Filch said quickly. Quick, tell me. Say please. Don't mess with me, Peeves. Now where did they go? Shan't not say nothing if you don't say please, said Peeves in his annoying singing voice. All right, please. Nothing. Ha ha, told you I wouldn't say nothing if you didn't say please. <laughs> and they heard the sound of Peeves whooshing away and Filch cursing in rage. He thinks this door is locked, Harry whispered. I think we'll be okay. Get off, Neville. For Neville had been tugging on one of Harry's bathrobe sleeves for the last minute. What? Harry turned around and saw quite clearly what. For a moment, he was sure he'd walked into a nightmare. This was too much. On top of everything that had happened so far, they weren't in a room as he had supposed. They were in a corridor the forbidden corridor on the third floor. And now they knew why it was forbidden. They were looking straight into the eyes of a monstrous dog, a dog that filled the whole space between ceiling and floor. It had three heads, three pairs of rolling, mad looking eyes, three noses twitching and quivering in their direction, three drooling mouths, saliva hanging in slippery robes from yellowish fangs. 
It was standing it was standing quite still, all six eyes staring at them, and Harry knew that the only reason they weren't already dead was that their sudden appearance had taken it by surprise. But it was quickly getting over that. There was no mistake that those thunderous growls meant. Harry groped for the doorknob between Filch and Death, he'd take Filch. They fell backwards, Harry slammed the door shut, and they ran. They almost flew back down the corridor. Filch must have hurried off to look for them somewhere else because they didn't see him anywhere, but they had hardly cared. All they wanted to do was put as much space as possible between them and that monster. They didn't stop running until they reached the portrait of the fat lady on the seventh floor. Where on earth have you all been? She asked, looking at their bathrobes hanging off their shoulders and their flushed, sweaty faces. Never mind that. Pig snout, pig snout, panted Harry, and the portrait swung forward. They scrambled into the common room and collapsed, trembling, into armchairs. It was a while before any of them had said anything. Neville, indeed, looked as though he'd never speak again. What, what, what do they think they're doing, keeping a thing like that locked up in a school? Ron said finally. If any dog needs exercise, it's that one. Hermione had both, had got both her breath and her bad temper back. You don't use your eyes, any of you, do you? She snapped. Didn't you see what it was standing on? The floor, Harry suggested. I wasn't looking at its feet. I was a bit busy with its heads. No, not the floor. It was standing on a trap door. It's obviously guarding something. She stood up, glared at them. I hope you're pleased with yourselves. We could have all been killed, or worse, expelled. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed. Ron stared after her, his mouth open. No, we don't mind, he said. You think we'd be dragged al you'd think we dragged her along, wouldn't you? But Hermione had given Harry something else to think about as he climbed back into bed. The dog was guarding something. What had Hackard said? Gringotts was the safest place in the world for something you wanted to hide, except perhaps Hogwarts. It looked as though Harry had found out where the grubby little package from Vault 713 was. Thanks for staying with us for Chapter 9 of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. We'll see you back tomorrow for another reading of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Bye, guys!